Hello, my name is Luke Ascarella, and we're going to be talking about uh, some of the PLM initiatives that I see both from a historical perspective and the changes that we're going to be taking on in the future, so the challenges of the uh, PLM in the future. So historically, uh, I'm an old guy, so I've been around a long, long time. So I started in, uh, in this field uh, back in the 1970s when there were no commercial software solutions available. So all major OEMs, automotive and, and aerospace, were uh, developing their own solutions, their own CAD CAM systems, their own CAE uh, codes. All right. And in fact, uh, the first PDM system I think I was involved with right, for a major automotive company. So, but back then, it was very interesting because when you didn't have commercial software, you didn't know what you were looking for. So you, it was an inventive process. It was highly innovative. It was highly collaborative. It was a group of people who got together every day and tried to figure out what was going to be necessary to help the, the engineering effort, product development effort. All right, and again, it all comes down to how do I make my products better, faster, cheaper. So that was the role. All right, what are, what are the tools that we can develop and give to the engineering community? And in order to do that properly, we actually, as the R&D uh, representatives, sat with the product engineers. So we were side by side with the product engineers, and we learned their job. So by doing their job, we were able to find areas where we could make them more efficient and optimize all right, their output. So that's what I was doing. Uh, I started uh, in 3D CAD, uh, and then I went to electrical uh, CAE. And that was interesting, and it was kind of a, uh, uh, it was an expert system back in the 70s all right, for uh, wire harness design for automotive. And it was, it was highly efficient and highly, uh, um, it was very popular. And at that time, we were looking at multiple workstations, all right, and then saying, okay, how, how do we do data exchange? Because now we recognize that collaboration was the bottleneck. So we gave efficient tools to the engineers, but we recognized that an individual optimization, all right, by giving an engineer, an individual engineer, more efficient tools helped him, but was not helping the collective effort of the overall process. So when we looked into that, we thought there needs to be a, uh, a push on how to make the collaborative processes more efficient. So the easiest thing to do was back then to say, well, geez, you know, if in, 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 instead of writing a, a, a CAD file off onto a tape and then mailing it to somebody or walking it across a campus to somebody, right, wouldn't it be nice if my computer could talk to their computer? There were no computer networks at the time, so we had to invent it. So again, it's a bunch of guys, highly innovative. One of the guys was an electronics uh, hobbyist, so he took a bunch of parts in his basement and was able to cobble boards that would make one computer talk to another computer and think that they were the same computer. And then we took copper wire and we soldered the connectors and we built it right from the copper all the way through. So we had to write the buffering routines, the protocols, the handshaking. Right. So we had to write the uh, FTP, the file transfer capabilities. And then we looked at it and said, well, now we need a database to, to store attributes and metadata. So we, create, we had to design and create databases and then we had to look at directories all right, to manage the, the people and the organizational aspects and, and, and access controls. Um, from there it was a user interface, so we had to create a user interface. And we did all this without using any operating system, all right, because the operating systems were too much overhead. So, so it was, it was a, uh, a very exciting time and you were able to invent and innovate every day, all day, so, and so, and then from there, uh, commercial software came into being, and 
and the OEM said, well, you know, we're not in that business anymore. Our business is to make cars, or our business is to make airplanes, not to make software. So the software industry grew up. And so I went from the OEM side of the world into the commercial software side. And I started with uh, PLM uh, vendors. And along with uh, in the early 90s with the web, I recognized that that was going to be the method to communicate and collaborate all right, for, for product development. So I formed my own company, leveraging web technologies, and it was highly successful. Uh, everyone loved it. It was a new paradigm. It was exciting, and, and again, it allowed people to share and collaborate, which is what natively everyone wants to do, and they recognize that that's important, and that's the overall process, is, is to collaborate, right? not, not through individual efforts. So that's why the web was highly uh, successful. So after that, I, I went into uh, uh, more R&D, okay? And now I'm looking at what are the next generation tool sets and methods that we're going to need for the future. Because I think the existing tool sets that we have have been optimized. And products are becoming more and more sophisticated and they are growing exponentially in their sophistication and our tool sets are lagging. So we need to have that leapfrog Right, into the technology arena so that we can catch up, if not keep ahead of the product sophistication demand. So that's where I'm at right now. That's why I'm with Geometric, because Geometric recognizes that, and I'm, I'm very uh, excited to be part of that process.